Beyond Ourselves by Catherine Marshall. Copyright 1961. Forward. Seventeen years ago, when illness hemmed me within the four walls of my bedroom, certain questions presented themselves to me with terrible urgency. Is it really possible for us to get in touch with the God who created our world? Why does God allow evil if he has the power to destroy it? Can God heal where medicine fails? Can prayer affect the outward circumstance of our lives? Does God guide people today? The search for the answers to these questions has brought adventure beyond anything I could have imagined. Beyond ourselves is the story of that search. Many others have shared in the explorations that made this book possible. Three persons especially have had a part in it, the first being a woman who died before I was born. I first met her in the pages of one of her own books. It was in the fall of 1944 that a copy of Hannah Whittall Smith's The Christian's Secret of a Happy Life fell into my hands. Superficially, the volume was anything but inviting. The print was small and cramped, the language quaint, the writing style outdated. All of this was understandable as the book had been written in 1870. Since then, with almost no advertising, this little volume has sold about three million copies. I wondered why. I soon found out. Here was a practical how-to book written in the days before there was any such thing. The chapter headings read like a table of contents still damp with printer's ink. How to enter in, that is, into the Christian life. Difficulties concerning guidance. Difficulties concerning doubts. Difficulties concerning faith. The zest and decisiveness of her writing revealed Hannah Smith as a woman who knew what she believed and why she believed it. In her day, hell and damnation were still major emphases across Christendom. Instead, her emphasis was that the Christian life is the happiest of all lives. Yet hers was no easy cult of happiness teaching, for she insisted that Christian joy could not be bought cheaply. There was no evading the total surrender of one's life and resources, no avoiding the giving up of doubt and the giving in to a costly obedience. I read the book through, then read it again. Certain chapters I returned to over and over. If I had a spiritual problem puzzling me, I could always find an answer in the Christian secret, provided I meant business about getting straightened out. Someday I told myself I would like to write the same kind of helping book for my time. In it, I would want to share, as Hannah Smith had, the discoveries, great and small, which had been of value to me in my Christian walk. The second person whose mark is indelibly on Beyond Ourselves is Peter Marshall. When I was a college girl in Atlanta, Peter first taught my attention by the recurring note in his preaching of conviction based on personal experience. In a hundred different ways, he said, I know this is so because I have experienced it. He talked often of God's guidance since he was an example of one whom the Lord had guided. He spoke ringing words about God's ability to provide material needs. God had provided his needs. He had much to say about Christianity being a joyous life. Those who bowled with him or accompanied him on fishing trips or to baseball games saw the joy firsthand. He insisted that a man need not be a sissy to love the Lord. Other men listened to him because he was walking proof. To us college girls, the surety of his conviction and first-hand faith were more fresh and more impressive than any preaching we had ever heard. Then after he became my husband, he continued to mold me. Here was the love of God pouring through as warm and vivid a personality as I have ever known. Through Peter, I saw that our love for God should involve the emotions. Why not? For emotion need not be maudlin it can also have a virile strength. He taught me and many another the difference between going through the mechanical motions of a church service 
and the art of corporate worship. Through him I learned what worship is. Peter imparted to me his knowledge of immortality. His sureness about it was a trumpet call of faith. He was certain of the continuation of a life beyond this one, certain in a way that few persons ever are. He took my tendency towards snap judgments of people and situations and taught me that there but for the grace of God go I. And I can never forget his insistence that women should be women, that in our femininity is our glory. All of this Peter did for me. Not often is there such a combination of husband and teacher. So far as Christianity is concerned, I sat at his feet as did thousands of others. I find now that his ideas, his convictions, even his word pictures have become a part of me, tissue and sinew. That is why any book I write is Peter's book too. I also owe to Peter in a strange sort of way, my present happiness. For he engrafted into me the truth that in God's scheme of things, there is no place for rivalry or jealousy. Each beloved person's place is secure, his own for this life and for eternity. No one can take it from him, nor does it impinge on anyone else's place. That is why Peter is and always will be a part of my life. It is also why Len can share him with me and is as grateful as I for Peter's influence on our life together. For the third person whom I want to mention in connection with the writing of Beyond Ourselves is of course Leonard Lesourd, whom I married in 1959, almost 11 years after Peter's death. I find that having an editor in the family has many compensations along with a few drawbacks. As the editor of Guideposts and a writer himself, Len understands the hours that every writer must keep the needed isolation. He is patient with me when I fall into a black mood because ideas are not flowing, sentences are wooden, and what I am turning out is just plain terrible. Always he gives me unstintingly of his fine editorial judgment. There are times, however, when I want to slam the office door on my manuscript and not think or speak of it until the next day but ideas do not keep ours for Len. Now, Catherine, if you shifted this section from the middle of chapter six to the end, or he'd say, I'd hate to mention it, but the material slows down here. Once he even telephoned me from a toll booth along the New Jersey Turnpike. I've been thinking about that chapter on forgiveness all the way down here. The opening paragraph still isn't quite right. Then, of course, like all editors, he is ruthless with the blue pencil. But somehow he always knows when I need to shut the door in my writing for longer periods of time. I want you to write fun on your calendar for X number of days, he will say every so often. See what you think of this plan for a trip. Someday, perhaps, I shall write about the adventure of rearing a second family. Just at the point when I thought child rearing was over, Len's three children have joined Peter, John, in calling me mother. There is Jeffrey, a mischievous and lovable five-year-old. Standing beside Peter John's six feet, four and a half inches, Jeff appears even tinier than he is. Chester, all of eight now, has enormous deep brown eyes and a well-developed passion for baseball. Peter John has earned his adoration by coaching him for Little League. Then there is Linda, who is at that about to grow up age of 12. She has always wanted a big brother and looks on the one she acquired as a dispensation straight from heaven. Linda is also ecstatic over having a writer for a mommy. She will be even more ecstatic, I hope, when she finds something about herself in this book. The sprawling white house with red shutters that is home is set in the rocky tree-shaded countryside of Westchester County. We have a rural mailbox, a school bus route, and moles in the lawn. Many experiences have tested me in my lifetime, but none more than this one, and none has made me happier. But writing about it must come later. 
A man swimming a horse across a turbulent stream does not stop to take a picture of the experience. I'll get my colts across the stream, see them thoroughly dried off, well fed, and on their way, then perhaps the picture. Thus with these three people, Peter, Len, and Hannah, always at my shoulder, Beyond Ourselves has been written. Though so different, each of them has one characteristic in common, enthusiastic delight in what Peter Marshall liked to call spiritual research unlimited. All too often, this enthusiasm is the missing ingredient in Christian circles. So, if I've succeeded in transferring to the pages that follow, one one hundredth part of the excitement that I feel about Christianity, I shall have achieved my purpose. Catherine Marshall, Chappaqua, New York, July 25th, 1961.